SpaceX, Starbase, Cape Canaveral. You've got questions, we've got answers. Thanks for tuning in to episode 76 of Lab Padre's Weekly Updates. Now let's dig in. Starting off this week on Friday morning, crews installed a new hatch on the side of the launch mount, replacing the one that was ripped off during the first integrated flight test. At the build site, a concrete pump truck was busy placing concrete for the final section of the floor slab for the currently under construction phases of the Star Factory's expansion. That night, the nose cone from the dearly departed Ship 22, which has now been repurposed into an HLS test article, was lifted out of mid-bay where it was converted. On Saturday, SpaceX performed several tests of the 20 Raptor Boost Quick Disconnects on the launch mount. This may be testing timing adjustments to the startup sequence following the shorter than planned static fire. Also on Saturday, the Ship 22 nose cone turned HLS prototype crew and cargo cabin, left the build site and was relocated to a new pad near the payload processing facility on the other side of Boca Chica Village. On Monday morning, the ground support equipment connection infrastructure for the ship cryostation by the launch tower was removed, likely as a result of the new station at Massey's making it obsolete. Early Tuesday morning, a repurposed booster liquid oxygen header tank, now labeled as property of the crew starship, was relocated from the build site to near the Ship 22 nose cone HLS prototype article. Just over an hour later, the Ship 24.2 test article was moved out of mid-bay and then parked near the ring yard end of Tent 3. Later that afternoon, Ship 29 was picked up by SPMTs and rolled out of high bay, giving us our first good look at the most recent fully stacked Starship. Just a short time later, however, the vehicle rolled back into high bay, finishing its repositioning and was ready for crews to resume work. About two hours later, that work on Ship 29 was already back underway as the first of the vehicle's aft flaps was delivered to High Bay for installation. Down at the launch site, several more tests of quick disconnects for the outer 20 Raptors on the booster were spotted as SpaceX continues to fine-tune Stage 0. Just after noon on Wednesday, the reconfiguration of the LR-11000 at the build site was complete and the crane lifted its boom and new luffing jib into the air. Just a short time later, the girders for the first of the new Mega Bay's bridge cranes was delivered to the area and offloaded by the newly reconfigured crane. On Wednesday evening, crews began destroying tent number two. Once the tents are removed, it is expected that groundwork will begin here to prepare for further expansion of the Starship factory. Also that night, the first flight-ready hot stage ring was rolled through the ring yard before making its way to Mega Bay for immediate installation on the top of Booster 9. This new section has a dome to protect the top of the booster while the vents all around the ring provide a means of egress for the exhaust from the ship. Crews continued to work overnight Wednesday into Thursday, demolishing tent number two through the use of excavators to tear the fabric and also pull down the supports. Thursday morning, a concrete pump truck was spotted at the launch site as SpaceX continues to work towards finishing the foundations for the expansion of the horizontal tank farm. Several hours later, Booster 10 was rolled out of the rocket garden and made a short trip down Highway 4 as it returned to the build site, possibly for engine installation. Around 1 o'clock that afternoon, the concrete pump truck was packed up after completing its work placing the concrete for the pedestals that will hold the new cryogenic storage tanks. That evening, the orbital pad was cleared and the system for the water-cooled steel plates was once again purged, presumably following some additional work on the system in recent days. Back down Highway 4, at the build site, the aft section of Ship 30 was relocated to High Bay as SpaceX approaches final stacking operations on yet another Starship. Late that night, the final sections of Tent 2 were pulled down, ending the quick destruction of the former production facility and paving the way for the new continued expansion of Star Factory. Mauricio with RGV Aerial Photography took to the South Texas skies once again on Wednesday and brought us more great pictures of Starbase. Looking at the Sanchez site, we can see that progress seems to be slow on the reconstruction of the ground fabrication building, but still pushing forward. 
Next to the building, crews are hard at work on what now appears to be four new stands of some kind. Near the container wall, one new stand that appears will have 20 booster hold-down clamps, looks to be more than three-quarters of the way through its initial assembly, while next to it, an assembly of a second identical stand looks to be beginning with its parts staged nearby. Just towards the bottom of the image, a somewhat less robust but still very substantial white stand that will likely have 10 booster hold-down clamps looks to be structurally complete, while construction of a second one has started next to it as well. Any guesses on what these new stands will be used for? Transport stands, engine installation stands, or something else altogether? Knock yourself out in the comments below. Moving down Highway 4 to the launch site, one of the big changes this week is the addition of the final water tank to the Deluge tank farm. While at first glance this tank may appear to be in place, a closer look shows that while it's in its cradles, it is offset from its final location. This offset is to allow crews access to cut a new hole in the bottom of the tank to create a new outlet that will connect to the 4 foot diameter supply header pipe underneath the tanks. Once the preparation work is complete, we should see the LR11000 pick the tank up again and set it in its final place. Over at the former landing pad, the forms for the final pedestals for the tank farm expansion were visible prior to their being filled with concrete the day after this picture was taken. And finally, looking over at the orbital launch mount area, we can see that a few sections of Fondag around the legs had been removed and were awaiting replacement. At the edge of the pad, concrete formwork seems to indicate that SpaceX is building a small wall, likely to try to prevent water from running off the pad when the deluge system is activated. Switching over to Florida, shortly after 1 o'clock Friday morning, Falcon 9 Booster 1069 lit up the skies as it carried 22 more Starlink V2 Minis to low Earth orbit. Saturday afternoon, Doug returned to Port Canaveral, carrying just the fairing halves from the Starlink Group 6-8 mission, but also those from the previous day's Group 6-9 launch. On Sunday morning, Falcon 9 Booster 1078 was laid down onto the transporter for its return to Roberts Road following the Starlink Group 6-8 launch, its fourth mission. Just three hours later, Gator Cam caught Doug towing a shortfall of Gravitas back out to sea for their next round of recovery operations supporting another Starlink launch. An hour and a half later, Crosby Skipper returned to Port Canaveral with Just Read the Instructions and Booster 1069, now sporting nine flights worth of soot. Tuesday morning, Booster 1069 was lifted off of the drone ship and placed onto the dock for initial processing ahead of its transfer to the stand for leg stowing. Wednesday afternoon, fairing recovery vessel Bob headed out of Port Canaveral with a destination of Savannah, Georgia, possibly for maintenance and repair work at the shipyard there. And finally for this week, late Wednesday night, Space Launch Complex 40 saw its second launch in less than a week as Booster 1067 launched the Starlink Group 6-10 mission. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. We'll see you next week and thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out!